Well, it was just before the Easter season, and uh, Tom was sitting in his science class, and the science uh, teacher stood up towards the end of class and said, you know, the Easter story is nothing but a myth. And in fact, uh, there is no such thing as a miracle. And if there's no such thing as a miracle, then uh, this story of Jesus rising from the dead is uh, just an ancient tale. And uh, the teacher said, in fact, uh, I, I don't even think that there's a God in heaven. And uh, if there was a God in heaven, I know he wouldn't allow his son to be crucified on earth for humankind. Tom quietly spoke up and said, well, sir, uh, I believe in God. And I believe in the resurrection. So the teacher said, well, you know, you, you, all right, you can have your opinion. You can, you can have your belief. But uh, let me uh, tell you, the resurrection uh, is not a scientific fact. It cannot be proven. In fact, miracles can't be proven. And God can't be proven. The teacher said, let me, uh, let me uh, propose an experiment for you. And he walked over. And he got out of the refrigerator a couple of eggs. And he said, uh, I'm going to take these eggs, and I'm going to hold them out, and I'm going to drop them. Now, uh, you say there's a God, you say there's a Jesus, you say there's miracles. Uh, I want you to say a prayer, Tom. Uh, gravity will draw these to the ground, and they will break. I want you to say a prayer as I drop them, that they will not fall and hit the ground, but a miracle will be performed and they will stop in the air. Tom, would you pray? Come on, Tom, get up and pray. So the teacher holds out his arms and Tom gets up and prays and says, uh, Dear Father, the science teacher doesn't believe in you. I pray right now that as he drops these eggs, that they will shatter into a hundred pieces, and when they do, he'll have a heart attack and die. <laughs> and of course, they all gasped. At which point, the teacher took the eggs <laughs> and put them back in the refrigerator. Now, <laughs> the teacher thought something but wasn't going to take the chance. And, you know, that's the way it is with so many people. They, they attack the existence of God, and they deny uh, his work in this world. And yet the Scripture says that the most uh, vital fact, the most uh, significant thing that demonstrates not only the existence of God, but his care and concern for humanity is the death, burial, and most of all, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For there are many people throughout history who have died for humankind. There are those who have died thinking that they could provide some forgiveness of sin for others. But there's only one resurrected Savior, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. And on this uh, Easter Sunday, the significance of the resurrection to us is the power that it brings for us to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. For us, the evidence of the resurrection can be exhibited in our lives as we are transformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Open up your Bibles with me this morning as we continue our study of the book of Ephesians, and today we're in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 24 through 32, where the Apostle Paul has commanded us in the previous verses to put off the old person, the old practices, and now he commands us to put on the righteous practices of the new person. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. When we trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation, believing that Jesus died for us, that he was buried, and that he rose again, 
we identify spiritually with his life. And in Ephesians 4.24, Paul says, now look, put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Paul has said elsewhere, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things will pass away. All things will become new. We are saved by grace through faith. And therefore, we are God's workmanship, being created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We can be someone new because we are someone new. When I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior, now again, we're not talking about belief here. We're not talking about intellectual faith. Uh, this week uh, at uh, Bob Willis's uh, funeral, I uh, shared again the story of uh, historic figures like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and uh, other people in history that we believe or we know existed, but they don't impact our life in a changing way. We're not talking about intellectual faith. We're not talking about about a temporal faith where we uh, grab on to God in times of crisis. But we're talking about a willful trust when we understand that Jesus Christ, the God-man, the mediator between us and God, died for our sins, that he was raised, and that by trusting him, we become one of God's children. We're a new person, and therefore we can change into righteousness and into the holiness of the truth. That is the goal of the Christian life. Again, Christians aren't sinless, but it is a process where we sin less. And uh, the process of becoming a Christian is not trying to sin less. It's trusting the sinless one, Jesus Christ, who then comes into our life and by the resurrection power, God begins to work in our hearts and lives and we find ourselves in righteousness and holiness and embracing the truth. And then Paul will give us some practical examples. And I call this replacement theology. I mean, we even understand this uh, from a a psychological point of view or a counseling point of view. If you're going to put away an old habit, you have to replace it with a good habit. You just can't get rid of that thing without replacing it. But the problem is, where's the power to do it? And in the Christian life, the power to do it is in the power of the indwelling, resurrected Christ in our lives. As Paul said in Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Remember those years of trying to be righteous of trying to work for salvation, of trying to break old habits. And then you met Jesus Christ. And that new power and that new ability came into your life. And then slowly, ever so slowly, in my condition, in my testimony, but ever so slowly, over the years and the decades, you begin to see that God is at work to will and to work for his good pleasure in our lives. We are created in Christ Jesus, the likeness of God. And so he says in verse 25, the first thing that you need to do is, therefore, laying aside all of falsehood. Laying aside falsehood. What is falsehood? Well, it's whatever is not true. It's uh, whatever is a lie. It's flattery. It's exaggeration. It's, uh, it's putting a spin on something. It's uh, most of our marketing and advertising in this world. It's, uh, it's saying to somebody when you're hurt, oh, it doesn't matter when it really does. Or when you're upset, saying to somebody, oh, it's no problem. Well, you know it is. Or uh, saying on the phone, well, they're not here when they really are. It's, uh, it's anything that is not fully 100% correct and truth. Therefore, he says, laying aside all of the falsehood. Laying aside the falsehood, what do you replace it with? Speak the truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. Why? For we are members 
of one another. Speak the truth. Elsewhere, Paul says, speak the truth in love. But we need to be truthful. We need to be honest. For deception only leads to greater problems and greater difficulties. And when you lie to somebody, you're going to live with that lie. (laughs) And you're going to do what? Have to tell another lie to follow up on that lie. And that lie will always be between you. And it will always cause problems. We need to lay aside falsehood. We need to speak the truth. We are family. We are members. And lies only lead to broken relationships. Verse 26, he says, Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your anger. This passage has caused many a commentator great difficulty, and mostly because of the idea that how could we as Christians be commanded or be allowed to be angry. This particular word for angry means an intense, angry mood to be provoked and to be dismayed. And yet, uh, the truth is, there is a righteous indignation. There is a time to be angry. We should be outraged at things that at times go on in our government. We ought to be outraged at times with some of the things that go on in society. We ought to be outraged at times with uh, the behavior of loved ones. We ought to be outraged when the Word of God calls us to be outraged. And there is an anger that is a righteous anger, and it's something that is a part of identifying with God. They did a special recently on the David Koresh cult. And I'll tell you, if you watch that, you had to have been outraged. Outraged at what this man did to those people. Outraged at what he did to the children. There is a reason and a time to be angry. And sometimes uh, we need to be angry with each other. When it's within the context of a violation of God's word or God's will, things that would ruin relationships or hurt the lives of people. Be angry. He says, and yet, don't go to that point where you will sin, where, as James says, the wrath of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. There is a wrath of God, and it focuses on the problem and it focuses on the solution and yet you can't continue to hold that anger as he says do not let the sun go down upon your anger particularly in the old testament we saw that sunset was a time for many old testament debts to be settled or set aside if a person gave you their cloak as part of a uh, guaranteed payment by the time the evening was over you had to return it Certain debts and certain issues had to be settled by sunset so that reconciliation could take place. I know that we've all experienced those times when we have taken our anger to bed. (laughs) Makes for a good night's sleep, doesn't it? It only kind of compounds it because you sit there and you argue in your mind and you toss and you turn and you get up in the morning and you're ready to fight again. And you've got all your arguments down. No matter how long you have to stay up, stay up and work it out. Don't let the sun go down upon your anger. If the person's not there, then turn it over to the Lord and give it to him to deal with and release it. Be angry and yet do not sin. And do not let the sun go down upon your anger. And then he says in verse 27, And do not give the devil an opportunity. 1 Peter 5, 8, The devil like a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. Jesus said, you know, the devil, he's the father of liars. He's the father of death. He is a murderer by nature. He speaks from his own nature. And he is the father of lies. And the father of anger. And we need to be careful that when we allow that anger to go on, that we are giving 
spiritual forces the opportunity to intensify it, to exacerbate it, to make it worse and worse, and to make reconciliation all the more difficult. We need to replace anger, righteous indignation, with reconciliation and the release. If we do not, we will find ourselves in times of spiritual agitation and spiritual warfare, even amongst the body of Christ, even amongst our family, that will only play into the hands of the one who would seek to destroy us. Verse 28, another replacement. Let the one who steals, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has a need. Uh, over the years, I have uh, had the opportunity to work with uh, different people, and uh, throughout that time, you, you know, you meet your occasional thief, and, uh, you know, they come to Jesus Christ, and they're sorry for stealing and for shoplifting or whatever they're doing, and, and they say to themselves, I don't know what to do. You know, so many places. How, how, how do I go back and make everything right? Well, you can't. But what Paul says is, look, stop stealing and instead start working. And start working so that you can start giving. Instead of taking, give. And that's the answer. No, you can't go back and, and, and make everything right and, and uh, do everything uh, to uh, replace it all. The thing to do is to labor. And work is good for the soul. And it's a very biblical thing. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says this, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to attend to your own business, and to work with your hands just as God commanded you. We are to work, and we are to work not just to provide for ourselves, but to have the opportunity to give to other people. I'm reminded of the story of the senator who was walking out of the Capitol, and he was walking across to his car. And just as he was going uh, uh, down through the cars, a thief jumps out at him. And he uh, puts a gun in his uh, face, and he says, Give me all your money. And the senator looks at him and says, You, you can't rob me. I'm a United States senator. And the thief says, oh, my apologies. Give me all my money. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we replace. But the power of replacement is in the indwelling Christ. And we, we stop taking. Again, whether it's time at work, whether, you know, it's... Uh, and, our, and, and, you know, commercial advertising almost promotes stealing at times. Remember the story of the guy in the hotel room, and he happened to get a cheaper flight, and because he got a cheaper flight, therefore he could raid the uh, hotel refrigerator or what those little coolers are, you know? And, and, be, and because he'd gotten a cheaper flight, he, was, he had the freedom to splurge and get all the peanuts. You know, that's not the mindset. That's not the mindset. Work. We work so that we might have to give to others. Another thing to replace, verse 29, he talks about our speech. Verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Paul says you ought to watch what you say. Now, he's not just talking about cursing here. He's not just talking about, you know, off-color jokes. He's talking about anything that would tear another person down. And the word unwholesome is a very uh, poignant term. It was used of smelly, rotting fish. Now, when we uh, were on our vacation to San Francisco, we walked down through the fisherman's section, fisherman's wharf, and uh, those were fresh fish. <laughs> you know, Th they hadn't formally started to stink. But I know as my family walked down, they said, let's not spend a lot of time here. You know, I mean, you could just, like a half a block away, you could just smell it coming in. But there's nothing like smelly, rotten fish. Have you ever had that experience, you know, where they died on you? And, uh, or you left them too long? Even just trying to cook a fresh one in the house sometimes. 
That's what describes this unwholesome word. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good It is for edification, that is for the building up of the person, according to the need of the moment. In other words, we need to be very sensitive in each and every particular situation as to what kind of a word is going to build a person up. Now, remember, to edify a person doesn't mean to cheer them up. A person who is grieving. You know, I I just got a call from a good friend. In fact, you know him, Charles Slay. And uh, Charles uh, just found out that he has prostate cancer. And, you know, my responsibility there wasn't to cheer him up. It was to try to build him up, to impart some grace. And and so you weep with those who weep. And and you grieve and you empathize and and, uh, you try to offer some grace at that particular time. Uh, To edify, to build up doesn't mean to cheer up. It doesn't mean to make them happy. What is it at that moment? What word of comfort or even nonverbal communication What is going to impart the grace to the one who is there to hear? Now, I know amongst friends and sometimes even amongst family, there's a good sense of humor and and we can sense that when we've crossed over that line and gone from just having fun at someone's expense to really hurting them, we need to be sensitive about those unwholesome words. They are like stinking fish, and they can ruin a moment and ruin a relationship. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good. Is it good? Is it going to build the person up? Is it going to give them grace at this particular time? And then in verse 30, the Apostle Paul says, Now look, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. To grieve is to cause uh, great stress or sadness or insult even to a person. And when we allow unwholesome communication, when we allow things, sins like uh, falsehood and uh, sins like thievery to uh, be a part of our life, even as Christians, it, it grieves the Holy Spirit, that agent that has been put into our life to help us to grow and to be like Jesus Christ. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here again, you've got a grieving spirit, but you've still got the seal of salvation. Remember back in, uh, earlier in Ephesians 1.18, he says, We were sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. After we heard the message of the truth and after we believed, we were sealed. That down payment of the Holy Spirit that comes into a person's life and guarantees their salvation and will promote their sanctification or their holiness and becoming like Jesus Christ. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't work against him. He has sealed us until the day of redemption. Verse 31, let all bitterness. Now I want you to notice as we go through this little list of um, angry emotions, how it will start one deep down and then it gets louder and louder and louder until you're clamoring and blaspheming against a person. And that's the way, you know, sin or anger or bitterness is. Let all bitterness, bitterness uh, speaks of an animosity, an inner quiet kind of anger. In Hebrews 2.14, Paul said this, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Let no root of bitterness spring up amongst you, and by it defile the many. You know, one bitter person can become a a festering wound in, in an office or in a family or in a neighborhood or in a club or in a church. Uh, I go over and swim at the summit fairly regularly. And there's one lifeguard over there who constantly is grumbling and complaining and agitating and working up all of the other kids. 
And, and, I, and I feel like, you know, going up to him and saying something to him, but I don't think it would do any good. <laughs> He's just not teachable. But you can see this one person just keeps the whole place agitated against uh, everybody else. And that happens. Let all bitterness and then wrath. Wrath is a, a step up above bitterness. It's more becomes an expression now of a strong desire or a passion. It's a longing at times for revenge. And then anger. Anger speaks uh, more of a, an agitation where you begin to see this outward uh, agitation. And then clamor. It becomes verbal. And then slander, you start to go after somebody and to speak people down. That's one of the things uh, we've all noticed, I'm sure, throughout uh, uh, our lives, is that bitter, angry people can't keep it to themselves, and they end up then gossiping or clamoring or uh, slandering those with whom they are angry or upset. And slander, let it all be put away with you, along with anything else that be, could be classified under this general term of malice. Malice deals with all kinds of wickedness. And, of course, uh, that's what uh, it leads to. Bitterness to wrath, wrath to anger, clamor to slander, and slander to all kinds of other problems and difficulties. You know, when we remain bitter... We are not punishing the other person. We are most and foremost punishing ourselves. Yeah, they may be miserable when they're around you, but you'll be miserable when you're around you all the time. And we cannot allow these kinds of sinful emotions to uh, carry on in our attitudes in our lives. Instead, what is the replacement here? The replacement theology, verse 32. Instead of all those things, first of all, be kind to one another. Kindness speaks here of adapting to the useful, suitable, excellent need of the moment. It speaks of a pleasantness, an uprightness, even a benevolence, a graciousness. We ought to be kind to one another. So somebody did you wrong. Get over it. That's what you need to do as a Christian. Not only get over it, but, but to understand that you know, there's probably reasons behind that particular behavior that uh, upset you or came towards you. And, and so you try to be tender-hearted. Tender-hearted is a word that speaks of empathetic. It's a Greek word which means to have the same guts or to have the same intestines. It's to uh, empathize, to be compassionate and understanding with a person. We've all had that experience where, you know, somebody blew up at us or somebody went off on us and uh, you were fortunate enough to keep your cool and uh, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, you found out why they did. And you, you know, you said to yourself, well, you know, now I understand. And you can empathize uh, with the person. And, you know... As loved ones, we need to be there to absorb some of this stuff at times, don't we, uh, for each other. Uh, whether it's the husband coming home and absorbing the difficulties of the wife's day or the wife absorbing the difficulties of the husband's day or friends listening to friends, uh, we need to have that kind of tender-heartedness. But thirdly, you've got to close it out by forgiving each other. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. And, and forgiveness is the offering of grace. It's the canceling of a debt. It's the giving of a pardon. It's uh, releasing the person and the judgment to God. Now, forgiveness, again, doesn't mean that things are as they used to be, necessarily. Uh, forgiveness is the release of a debt, but it doesn't mean that you're not responsible to follow through on whatever steps are necessary, that the problem doesn't happen again, that there is a solution and some kind of resolution that is offered. But we are to forgive each other, and then this last phrase is the standard. We're to be kind, tender-hearted, and to forgive each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you and me. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. 
And uh, we have this tremendous unconditional forgiveness, past, present, and future in Jesus Christ. I was uh, reading the, the theology of John uh, Wesley uh, the other night, just uh, picking up on some uh, historical theology. And, you know, Wesley went through a kind of a transition in his life because he got very frustrated with uh, people who called themselves Christians but who carried on with sinful habits. And that was very frustrating to him, and he actually had a shift in his theology where he said, well, you know... We're forgiven in Christ Jesus, but only for our past sins. That there is no guaranteed forgiveness for future sins unless we ask for them. Well, John was reacting to a situation instead of interacting with the scriptures. Colossians says all the debts, past, present, and future, have been canceled against us. And Paul says... God forbid that we should ever take the grace of God advantage and, and abuse it. But the truth is this, that from before we were born until our final glorification, God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus. And the more we think about that grace, the more we will love him and the more we will not want to abuse it. It is not a theology of fear, it is a theology of love and grace. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. A true believer, all of their sins are forgiven. Are there consequences? Yes. <laughs> there are still consequences on earth. There are still the complications and the problems and the consternation that it brings. But from an eternal perspective, we have been forgiven. For eternity in Christ Jesus. And that's what we need to offer to other people. Instead of uh, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and all kinds of malice, as believers in Jesus Christ, we rise to the resurrection life, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we extend kindness, empathy, compassion, and forgiveness just as God did. Remember what Romans says. While we were yet sinners, helpless, ungodly, and enemies, that Christ Jesus died for us. And I know it's really, really hard to give up vengeance. It's really, really hard to give up getting back. It's really hard. But you know what? It's a whole lot harder to hold on to it and the impact it has upon our lives. We must put off the sinful practices of the old self. We must put on the practices of the new self. As Christians, we are new creations and can no longer live according to the former lifestyle. Replacement theology. Take that which is bad, replace it with that which is good, and do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way it can be done. I know that there are people who are very, very frustrated in their religious experience because they think their religious experience is what is uh, going to lead them to salvation and to holiness. And it's not a religious experience. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship where I say, you know what? He died for me, a sinner. He was buried for me. He rose and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and to save me. And by that work, the power of God comes into our lives and begins to transform us. Let's pray.